In starting Green Heifer Farms, one of the first government agencies we partnered with was the NRCS. They have helped us develop conservation plans that protect our natural resources. In this video, I'm going to speak with Mark Dempsey of Carolina Farm Stewardship Association about why your small farm may want to consider partnering with them too. Hello. <laughs> Good to see you. Yeah, nice to see you again. Can you tell us who you are? Yeah, sure. My name is Mark Dempsey. I work for the Carolina Farm Stewardship Association as a technical service provider. Uh, and I think that we'll have a lot of time today to talk about what that means. But in short, it means I write conservation plans that are always through the USDA and RCS. Hey, everyone, it's Farmer C from the future coming in with a quick interruption. I just want to emphasize that my farm has actually partnered with NRCS. I am not recommending that anyone do something that we have not done. We have partnered with them on a few efforts, high tunnel assistance, cover crop assistance, development of conservation, planning activities, our transition to organic plan, also known as CAP or CPA 138. So we have ourselves partnered with the NRCS. This photo is actually me sitting with my local NRCS agent, Gabby, who is Fabulous. And if you haven't watched the video of NRCS's visit to our farm, I'll link that up above. But okay, back to Mark. Um, maybe you see some kind of online marketing for these plans. We at CFSA, who I work for, do a lot of marketing of the conservation plans that we write because we want growers to have access to them and to know about them. And uh, a lot of the folks that we serve do not are not very aware of NRCS's programs and how they can be helped by them. So um, that said, it should always begin with, or maybe I should say it must always begin with talking to your local NRCS person. And um, there are fairly easy resources to find online to figure out who that is or what number to call to figure that out. And I'm guessing there's a cost associated with these plans? There's a cost that's paid for entirely by NRCS. It is a total win-win for the grower. And in this case, for us, like the technical service provider, um, where NRCS pays to have the plan written, we get the majority of that payment in our case. Uh, mm -hmm. But the, there's zero dollars that come out of pocket for the grower. So just to add to that, depending on which practice a uh, producer is trying to implement, they should anticipate having um, resources up front or some amount yep. of resources up front. Even if they get an advance payment, there's still um, a likelihood that they may need some out-of-pocket resources. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, thank you for flagging that because there's there's a really important distinction here that I don't think I did a great job of explaining. When we, if we rewind all the way to the beginning that these plans have no out-of-pocket out expense for you, that's to have the plan written. But if you're going to like go into the next phase, which is like actually implementing, you probably are going to have out-of-pocket expenses to put in your cover crops, install a high tunnel, maybe. Um, so on and so forth, unless you get that advanced payment, but that's rarely 100%. I think it's usually 50% of their of what they're going to pay you, which again is either 75% of their estimated total or 90. So you're either getting, what would that be? Whatever half of 75 is up front or half of 90% up front. Um, and that's in a good case scenario. So um, definitely be prepared for out-of-pocket expenses. So um, the NRCS pays two different rates, basically. Okay. If you're a struggling to serve grower, you get more money. And our, I think, obvious read on that is that money is supposed to go in the hands of the grower and not a PSP. So okay. yeah, at the end of the day, it should just be a win-win for both parties. And yes, okay. we and other TSPs provide a, some incentive payment that we just refer to as a rebate payment. Okay. okay. And it's important to note that um, the government, um, USDA, does not have a lot of programs where it will pay 100% of the cost. And this is one of those that they're like, we will cover 
the cost of getting these plans in place because they want the farmers to implement these practices. We at CFSA, we, we write a particular one that is geared toward folks who grow organic or want to get certified organic. And it's called the 138. These all have numbers associated with them. So we, we write this 138 that um, is geared toward organic production. And by that, I mean, it's for one, it's going to literally provide for you the paperwork that you need to get certified if you want to do that. That is optional at the end of the day, but that's part of the intention and that will be provided as part of the deal. Um, the other part of it is writing up and providing guidance on organic practices if you need that kind of help. So if you, for example, have like pests X, Y, and Z, maybe you're new to, to farming or maybe these pests are new to you. In theory, we'll be able to provide um, some feedback on how to manage those pests using organic practices. So that's like, I think a pretty helpful thing for this type of plan. Um, and of course, like any and all conservation plans it documents problems that you might be having on your farm related to natural resources like soil erosion, soil organic matter depletion, water quality issues and so on. It, it always documents those, that's like a standard thing. So that's the 138. And then of course I'm most familiar with that because I've been doing that for seven years here, but um, there are a handful of other ones, I think maybe between 15 and 20 um, that are very specific and geared toward addressing specific needs. Like there's a new one that's focused solely on improving soil health. There are other ones that are about um, managing livestock manure to prevent water quality issues downstream. There's ones that are for managing livestock feed, managing aspects of air quality, so on and so forth. And, um, and um, it is important to flag that I said earlier, there's this new way of NRCS doing things where um, they used to have the conservation planning activities, which was split. The old version is um, conservation activity planning. More recently, it's been split into conservation planning activities. The intention behind these conservation planning activities or CPAs is to identify quote unquote resource concerns, which is just problems with soil erosion and other natural resources on your farm, to identify them and rough out a plan for how to address those problems. That's what the CPA is. And in the new version of NRCS, they also have this quote unquote design and implementation. So they're DIAs, design implementation activities, um, that most plants are paired to have uh, the original conservation planning, the CPA, along with the design and implementation phase, the DIA. So for example, the 138 that we write also has a pair um, that's the 140. And so if you get a 138, you can get a 140. And the, the only difference between them is one is to identify the problems and rough out a plan. That's the 138 or the, the CPA. And the, the next or phase two of that, which is the DIA, is to design and very much, let's just say, design in good detail uh, how to address those problems. And then, then it's set in stone. Um, and then you're supposed to follow that plan to the T in order to get reimbursed for the practices that you've implemented on your farm. Um, most practices that NRCS uh, provides financial assistance for, it, their, their uh, economics are based on larger farms until very recently. It's only very recently that they've started using kind of like this small farm model where they'll pay, instead of paying like four bucks to the acre to do cover crops, because like what small farmer is going to benefit from that, um, it, it may benefit larger growers, sure, but it doesn't benefit smaller growers. It's only very recently that NRCS has acknowledged that and kind of like worked that into how they pay farmers back. So there's like a usually an acreage limit. If you're putting it in on less than an acre, then they'll pay you a much higher rate because it's a pain in the neck to do compared to, you know, your 4,000 acre farm or whatever that they're more used to. By saying yeah. there's probably around 200 practices. Wow. And I, I cannot remember if it's like 275 or 175, but somewhere in that ballpark of like, there's a lot of practices out there that NRCS will pay for. But usually for most farms, that do like veggies or livestock, the majority of the practices don't apply to them. So um, there are practices that are specific to livestock, specific to row croppers, specific to forest managers and so on. 
Um, and then there's a lot that's just about like wildlife and habitat management that could apply to anyone. Um, but so I happen to work with a lot of specialty crop producers and so small scale veggie, fruit, herbs related. Um, so they're accessing financial assistance to implement cover crops, install mulching to reduce soil erosion or conserve soil moisture, put in drip irrigation systems, install high tunnels. That's a really popular program that I always recommend folks try to take advantage of if you're um, working with crops that would benefit from growing in a high tunnel. It's just a really simple thing to do and it's um, in theory can really improve your bottom line for getting a high quality crop. Um, let's see here. There's a lot of things that are specific to protecting waterways if you're a livestock producer. Basically things around fencing livestock out from uh, waterways or providing them a, a drinking water source that's an alternative to the waterway and then things to do around that drinking water source to prevent uh, the soil from getting very mucky and so on and so forth. So it, it often is very specific to the production system. Uh, uh, one of the more popular ones that I do want to mention that's widely applicable is a pollinator habitat, which the NRCS usually refers to as conservation cover. Um, and I think informally is just referred to as pollinator habitat, which a lot of folks are interested in providing that kind of habitat for um, beneficial insects and, and any other wildlife that would take advantage of it, whether it's like ground nesting birds that you might want to prioritize because you care about ground nesting birds, for example. Um, but as we all know, pollinators are important and pollinator habitat serves more than just uh, insects that pollinate our crops and stuff, but you know, good guy bugs is what I call them, and they're you know our, our pred predators that eat our bad guy bugs. Time doing this, I think I've probably only ever worked with about thirty, you know, which is it, most of those were kind of infrequent use, um, and then a, a handful of those make it into almost every one because crop growers should be using cover crops, for example. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. What are some of the practices that are being um, implemented by forest land um, on, owners? Because that's very different than those who have their land in production for agricultural crops. Yeah, good question. And um, there's the handful that I'm familiar with are either about habitat management for improving mm -hmm. like it's quality for live, sorry, not livestock, for uh, wildlife. Um, options if you were a livestock producer wanting to use your forest for that, which would, could you, you could call uh, silvopasture or agroforestry. Um, and there's a couple of practices to like install that and get that up and running. But for the most part, that's not offered everywhere, not a very popular one. But otherwise we're talking about like improving the habitat for wildlife, Improving the forest stand for later harvest, that's usually some kind of a thinning um, or prescribed burning to get rid of that quote unquote fuel load that builds up if it hasn't seen a fire in a long time um, and just puts everyone at risk of wildfire, I think. So um, those are the main ones that come to mind. But being that I'm not a forester and have little background in it, I'm, I don't want to say a ton more about it because I just don't know. But um, that's more or less, I think, the, the main ones in the gist of that. Okay. How long do these? plans last once you get it established is it a three-year or five-year what's the duration that's a good question too yeah i think it uh the simple answer is it depends on what practices you plan to implement and so a lot of nrcs practices are one year so like for example you use cover crops they're annuals they're done after a year you only get paid once for that one year thing it's just to kind of get you going on cover crops but for other practices that are more structural or you're like investing in some something uh, some kind of infrastructure, whether it's a high tunnel um, or an irrigation system, they're longer lived. So you might get three, five, or 10, and some are 15 and and longer years. Um, so it totally depends on the practice. And um, if you wanted to know more about that, we maybe we could drop a link in for, if, for the very curious who want to go looking after how many years you get out of any uh, any one given practice. Okay. And once these plans are developed, is it set in stone? Is there an opportunity to go back and make changes if necessary? How rigid are they or how flexible? 
I would say the the CPAs that phase one plan, which is in our case, we write that CPA 138, the just get you started, just get you started. That one is not set in stone. It's flexible. It's what it's doing again is identifying resource concerns. That's the language that the NRCS uses, um, but which could be like you have soil erosion. Let's identify that that's a problem and try to figure out together how to address that problem. So that would be like the more flexible plan. Phase two, the DIA, the design and implementation activities, that's when it's quote unquote set in stone. And if you deviate from that plan, you won't get reimbursed uh, that 75 or 90% that we talked about. So mm -hmm. the lesson there is simply make sure you get that plan right exactly how you want it, the grower, mm -hmm. uh, working with your technical service provider or maybe with NRCS staff to get that thing right so that once you install it or implement your cover crops or whatever it is, you actually get reimbursed for it because you don't want to um, deviate from the plan and that set in stone plan. If you did, you would not get paid. So that would be that would be a big bummer. With the TSP, such as you, you get this lovely plan. I have this plan now. What is the next step? Who should I call? Who do I turn to? What what do I do now in order to be able to carry this plan out? What's my course of action? Yeah, so if you if your next goal is to implement conservation practices that are let's say outlined in that plan, given the new structure, the phase two would be to go to back to NRCS and say I'm I'm ready to implement. Let's draft up that DIA. That's the design and impl implementation activities. Uh, which is the one that sets it in stone for you. Now, there's a chance that, and I, I don't know, I'm not like fluent enough in NRCS processes to know if this is or isn't true, but there's a chance that you might be able to, given or with certain plans, circumvent the DIA and just go straight to practices. I, I'm not sure who would design those um, because there's a, a design component that needs to be worked in there that I think NRCS either prefers to do it themselves or hire it out to a TSP like us, um, as opposed to let's say the grower just deciding what they're gonna do just because NRCS has rules around that. Um, so it, my next, my recommendation for next step is to go to the phase two, the DIA, but I don't know that that's universally true for all situations and it may be possible to jump straight into um, just simply applying for a practice based on what was written in your your phase one plan, that CPA, um, which perhaps we can revisit that or, uh, and if it's possible, put some like supplemental info at the bottom of this video or um, come back again later on that one. What are some of the, I guess, success tips? What would you say this is a way to really um, help ensure a positive experience. And here are some things that farmers should consider when they're thinking about going into partnership with NRCS. Yeah, these are great questions. Um, the first thing I would suggest to anyone who's going to work with NRCS is ex don't expect it to be super fast and to plan to have patience as you go through the process. And so the NRCS is part of the USDA and uh, is a large bureaucracy that where a lot of boxes need to be checked along the way. And sometimes hiccups happen, staff changes or otherwise, and your application might get held up or something about your contract might get held up. Um, and they, they usually run their um, review of your application and approval on an annual basis. And so you might put it in and for example, you might put in an application for a, a conservation plan in June and not hear back until the following March. Um, and then you get the plan written and it's another year before you can consider getting paid for it. So there's patience that you're just going to have to have built into the process or otherwise you're just going to be frustrated. The, the need for like some tenacity to just like keep bothering people if you don't get what you want because there are staff changes and often um, certain staff cover very large areas. And they'll get to you uh, when they're done with X, Y, and Z, but just don't let them forget about you, <laughs> uh, which I'd like to think doesn't happen very often. But, you know, you always hear a story here and there of um, someone having to be very persistent in order to uh, get their contract moved all the way through. Obviously, you have to share a certain amount of uh, your personal information with NRCS, which is held to be private, 
to certain standards. Um, but, you know, some people are finicky about how much the government knows about their life and so on and so forth. So um, that's maybe another consideration. Um, if you do find that you are reaching out to your NRCS person or some, yeah, whether it's your local staff or regional staff person, and you feel like you're not getting the response that you want, I suggest always feeling free to reach out to someone like myself who is a technical service provider and can, um, can be an advocate for you and to have some accountability to just let someone, let the uh, USDA staff person know that there's a TSP waiting to write their plan, for example, um, and they're, you know, they're waiting in the wings for the next step to happen. And I, I think building an accountability into a relationship like that can be helpful for all parties and save anyone the, the trouble of wondering whether there's maybe discrimination happening or anything like that. Well, this has been very helpful. Um, I am going to include additional information for everyone and I'll be sharing um, with this audience as I'm implementing and going through the process. So this information is going to be super helpful because we definitely want as many farmers and producers and ranchers and landowners as possible to take care of the land, right? And implement these practices because we're not getting any more. This is all we have, people. So we've got to take care of it. Um, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And I will uh, see you. <laughs> Sounds great. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Mark. Yeah. Bye. Bye-bye.